Today, we're gonna to talk about another way to improve your landscape photography that doesn't involve getting more practice with your camera settings or compositions. As landscape photographers, we all wanna get better at our landscape photography. And a lot of the emphasis on doing so focuses around getting better at your camera settings, learning your techniques with the camera, learning better composition. And all of those things are important, whether you're a beginner, advanced, or somewhere in the middle. There's always room to build that foundation, strengthen the foundation, and enable you to get those types of pictures you want out in the field. If you can make the tools second nature, let you focus on the creativity and the compositions and in creating interesting photographs. And even on this YouTube channel, a lot of my focus tends to be on techniques, how to do this with the camera, how to do a composition like this. A lot of how to that is a little more on the technical side, a little bit on the artistic side as far as compositions and approaching a scene. But there's another important consideration that I think a landscape photographer can do to improve their landscape photography. And that element that doesn't get talked about quite as often to improve your photography is deliberate consumption of other photographers' photographs. And I've talked about this in the past, especially in some of my social media videos where I talk about how I don't necessarily think it's an evil thing, and it's an opportunity to sort of slow the scroll, look at the photos that you're seeing on Instagram, threads, or Facebook, and really pay attention to them and think about them critically. But over time, I've come to realize that yes, while I hang out on social media, it's very hard not to be distracted. If you're on your phone consuming content, there's notifications going off, there's emails coming in, text messages, there's, oh, I've got a, a 10 second law, I'm, I'm boom, I'm off looking at some website or over on Reddit consuming some content and getting distracted. So I've sort of come to the realization, I think I have a better tip on how to deliberately consume landscape photography, and that is through the consuming of content through actual physical photography books. So why photography books? Well, why well, wouldn't say I'm an avid collector of photography books? I do have a few in my collection. Looking at other photographers' work can help you improve your own if you take some time to think about the photo that you're consuming as you view it. But why books specifically? Well, first they have some heft. They are something you can actually physically hold in your hand. You can pick them up, they have some weight, that you, you can touch them, you can feel them. You know, the, the, even the covers can exude things. This nice smooth cover from this book here, we'll talk about in a bit. And then you've got these sort of more cloth bound covers over here like this, we'll also talk about this one. But they have actual physical characteristics, which is just different than holding your phone or holding your iPad or scrolling through on a computer. That physical, presence of the book is there's just some value to it. And I think it's a great way to consume photography. The other piece is you can disconnect when you get a book. If you're browsing on a device, whether it be a computer, phone, tablet, there's always distractions. If you take a book, you can pick it up and you can carry it with you outside, or you can put your devices down, leave them in the other room and take this book, get your favorite beverage and sort of sit down with it. it helps remove those distractions because you, you haven't brought the distraction device with you. It's just your book, your beverage, and you can take some time to sit and think without those distractions. The other element is because books have this physical presence, there's sort of a higher hurdle to release your work in that form or fashion. So whereas social media, Facebook, Instagram, it's really easy. You can take any old photo, post it to Instagram or Facebook, and it's just a constant stream of photos. There doesn't take as much thought about curation. And that's not to say some photographers don't curate their photos well on Instagram. Some take painstakingly amounts of time to make sure only the best of the best goes on the social media. But then there's a lot of photographers that don't do that. I mean, I honestly fall into the camp of I post content to share it. It's not necessarily all my greatest work. It's just work I've done and work I've practiced areas I've been to. Whereas if you get into a book, it's a collection of images. It has sort of forced the photographer to think about what is worth putting in a book. They're constrained by page counts. They're constrained by cost. So they really deliberate over what goes into the book more so than what you might be putting on a website or social media. So to me, a book sort of lends itself to sort of a, a bar to know that you're getting some of the best work of that photographer because they probably had to think about it and curate it to a much higher degree than they might have just posting to social media. So you're sort of getting the best of the best in a book. And finally, not only does it work that way with individual photographer books like this, where they've curated the work together, there's photography books out there that are collections of photographs. Um, this, this particular one over here, again, we're gonna talk about it in a bit, is actually a collection of multiple photographers' photographs. And in this particular case, for these books, it's sort of been curated by a judging panel, per se, of what gets into the book. So again, you're just setting that bar up high. If you're gonna take the time and money to invest in a book, that level of entry is probably high enough that you're gonna be seeing some very quality photos, photos that you probably should be studying, and they're sort of all self-curated for you. You just have to go out and pick up the book and consume it. 
So those are some of the reasons why my mindset and my approach to this consumption of content to help improve your own landscape photography has started to drift from deliberately consuming social media, which is still okay, but I think photography books is an avenue that might be overlooked a lot in a good way for you to consume this photography on a deeper level. So let's talk about consuming content in a photography book. So it's real easy. You could potentially just pick up a book, get it, open it up. You could have lots of things going on around you. You could be in a busy room and you could just sort of start flipping through just real quick. Oh yeah, that looks good. That looks good as, as you sort of flip through. And that's one way to consume a book, but really that's much, much closer to like the social media experience, just sort of flipping through and going, going through it. So sort of choose the environment you're gonna sit down and read this book in. That'll help you control those distractions as you consume this content, because there's a couple key things when you're looking at the photographs in a book that you need to do to actually, in my opinion, get the benefit of improving your landscape photography. If you're just consuming it casually, fast flip throughs going, oh, that's pretty and moving on, this probably isn't going to improve your landscape photography. There is a particular level of deliberateness that you need to consume this at in order to get the benefits that will help play into your own photography. So once you've sat down in a quiet spot, got your beverage of choice nearby, and you're able to focus and think about it, how do you consume this? Well, you would take a book and you would open it up and start looking through. Start paying attention to, as you look at photographs, what, what causes you to pause? What is special about that photograph? Is it how it's composed? Is it something more simplistic in nature? How the subject is very well defined? Is it sort of a chaotic scene? So as you look at these photographs, start to think about what some of the common elements are of what might have caused this photographer to include it in their book or be curated from a group of photographers into a book. You know, look at the editing styles. Uh, so editing, take a look at the editing and does it match your editing? Is it close to your editing? Is it similar in genre? What are they doing different? Are they being more bold with their editing? Are they being more natural, fewer edits, lighter editing? Is, uh, you know, are they using high contrast images, low contrast images? All these things are things that you should sit think and really think about, take a photo and look at it and look at it for like five minutes. Just look and see what's going on. What's going on at the edges of the frame? What is the subject in the photo? Where is the subject position? Are the eyes being sort of drawn towards the subject or is the subject competing for things? If you take this slower methodical approach to consuming these photographs, you'll learn from it because you'll start to see common trends within a book across different books and it'll help you identify what a good photograph is. As you start to identify what a good photograph is, you can take those elements and then you have something to work on out in the field to bring to your own photography. If we go out and just practice our camera settings and you practice your composition based on what someone has said on YouTube, you don't really have a gauge to compare it to. It's like, yes, you're practicing camera settings, but where are you headed? Or do you have a direction? By consuming these books, and studying those photographs, you can identify the gaps of to, to what you need to work on. You know, in my case, if I flip through some of these books and we'll touch on it again in this book here, my editing style seems a little heavy handed compared to some of the stuff in a lot of these other books, which to me, as I study and consume the photographs that are making it into book format, that might be telling me that I need to work on my editing a little more to sort of refine it, make it a little more subtle, you know, a little more precise with it. So those are the things you're looking for when you look at it. Just be deliberate when you consume, don't just flip through, Take some time to focus and identify what you think is making these strong photographs and then compare where you're at with your photography to the photos in this book. And you can sort of set some goals to bridge that gap from one place to the other. Because really at the end of the day, studying the work of others, others that have sort of met this bar of quality photo is going to help you improve your landscape photography by letting you see what you can aim towards. Let's talk about choosing a photography book. Okay, so some of you probably already have landscape photography books on your shelf. You don't really need help with this part. So take this section. It's just a reminder to take some time, pull those books off the shelf, set some time aside, find that quiet place and consume them. So if you already know who you, who, what photography books you tend towards, what photographers you want to purchase and go for it, that's great. Again, just remember, take the time to consume them because them sitting on your shelf and not being looked at aren't necessarily gonna help you identify the traits that might make you a better landscape photographer or what makes a good photo. But for the rest of you, if you're interested in this consuming a photography book idea, but you're really not sure where to start, I have two tips for you on how I would approach it and how I've approached it in the past to sort of choose your books. And I'm not really gonna recommend specific photographers to go, go seek out because photography is such a personal, 
choice as to what you gravitate towards, whether you gravitate towards the grand scenes, that might take you towards another photographer. Um, maybe you like mountain photography, that might take you to another photographer. Or maybe you like a lot of small scenes work, which might take you to another photographer. So what I'm really gonna do is just sort of give you tips on identifying what to look for, not so much prescribe specific books or specific photographers to seek out. But hopefully these tips will help you if you're just getting started with collecting photography books to improve your landscape photography. So the first tip is, do you already have a favorite landscape photographer? A lot of people do. They have someone they already follow on Instagram or social media and they like their content. Well, in that case, check their website and see if they have a book. They would be a great place to start with. Purchase their book. You're gonna get to see, one, you're gonna get to support them. The book, you know, the money from the book helps goes and support your photographer more than social media will. So that purchase can actually help support some of your favorite photographers, which is a great thing. Second, while you may be used to consuming their content on the social media in a book, you're getting their curated version of it. You're getting what they think is the best of the best, the ones that merited getting printed in a book and sold to others. So again, it sort of provides that bar of quality photos. You're gonna consume what that photographer thinks is a quality photo. If you already respect and like that photographer, you should be sort of interested in their mind. What do they think is good? This is a uh, pretty much the definitive way to see. This is what they thought made the cut. So it sort of gives you an insight into their mind and curation process while letting you consume what they consider the best of their best photos. So I have a couple examples here with me. Again, these are just photographers that over time that I've enjoyed consuming their work or interactions with them online or something like that. So let's take a look at these again. Don't feel like you need to go out and get this specific book. I think they're good. They fit sort of my style of photography and I'll sort of touch on the reason behind each one of these two. I'm gonna look at two books. I've got a couple more on the shelf, but I sort of chose these two as sort of examples as to why I gravitated towards it. First one here is we've got Conversations with Nature from Eric Bennett. One of the things I really like about his photography and his work is the editing is just, I, I really appreciate the style. That's what draws me to his work. His work is well edited, but subtle. It's not over the top. And when, like I said earlier, when I compare my photographs to something that might be in his, and then some places we've been through similar places like Death Valley or something like that where I've photographed, his work just has this nice, soft subtleness to it. The light is there, but it's not super contrasty and, and glaring. So. When I look at his book, a lot of it was for flipping through and seeing how did he approach scenes? How did he edit? For example, this right here, get the glare off of there. This is a Death Valley scene and it's just, it's just spectacular. It's got a little bit of color, it's subtle, it's there. I've got Death Valley pictures. I took Death Valley pictures. And I think some of my compositions might be in the ballpark, not as consistent as Eric's are, but his approach to editing is sort of what I wanted to see in this book and see. So it's, it's a perfect way for me to sit down and approach this book. When I'm saying, think about the image when you look at it in the book, a lot of my thoughts going through is how did he edit? You know, here's an image that if I took like that, I probably would have way over contrasted that, making the brights way too bright and the darks way too dark. Whereas he's just got this really nice subtle edit to it. You still see the light, the light is still interesting. You obviously know there's interesting light at play, you got some clouds, but just his approach was just, I don't know, I like that subtly to it. And, I, and it's just a recurring theme in his book. Again, another reason a book is really, really excellent because I don't have to go scour and look for his images across the internet, on his website and Instagram. I sort of get a, a feel into what Eric thinks is some of his best work and I can sort of piece together the style, what I like, and start to define that so I can start to identify those gaps from my editing style to his editing style. Now, of course, there's composition tips in here as well by watching, by looking at these photos and seeing how he approached it. Again, Death Valley. I photographed there, he's photographed there. I can look through here, study his Death Valley images and see what he did differently. Did he include more in the scene, less in the scene? Uh, was it camera height, angles? All of those things that if I'm deliberate about consuming the photography is gonna inform me of gaps between where I'm at as a photographer and where he's at as a photographer. So super handy to do with someone that you admire. They're one of your favorite photographers or photographer whose editing style you happen to like, or maybe one that just works in regions you'd like to go to. Again, mountains, woodlands, you know, if you gravitate towards one or the other, consider picking up a book from a photographer that focuses on those. Okay, next up, I got one more book from a specific photographer and we'll set this one over here. So this way here is we have Ebb and Flow from TJ Thorne. Now I gravitated towards this one because TJ's a really nice guy. I have only conversed with him online some, but he's always been super helpful. And you know, I respect that and appreciate that. He's always been happy to provide tips and, and advice and things like that. So a big fan of TJ from that standpoint. And his photography is amazing as well. So this is a book, Ebb and Flow. And here's what intrigued me about it beyond just TJ being a great guy is this whole book 
is photos of water. It's water moving, flowing, and it's small scenes of water. So let's take a look here. Let's, uh, let's find an image here. So just small scenes of water. That's what the whole book is. So to me, what that really does is, so one, TJ opens a little bit with his, his relationship to water and why he focused on water on this. But two, as a photographer, and I've mentioned in lots of past videos, I'm working on learning small scenes and how to photograph small scenes. And here's just a wonderful curated example of how someone took water flowing through rivers, ponds, creeks, seashores, and photographed it in interesting ways. There's so much, to me, it sort of taught, is teaching me how to look at things differently. So I could be walking my local metro park, there could be a little creek going by, and I might be like, oh, nothing too interesting. But if you go through TJ's book here, Ebb and Flow, you can see how he approached it, and he can sort of teach you to see things in a different way, sort of train your creative eye, so that when I'm walking by a creek in a local metro park that I might otherwise just walk by because I'm like, it's just a creek in a metro park, there's potentially inspiration from this book on how to photograph it in an interesting way that makes an, an image that tells a story. So that's one of the big reasons I picked up this book. I was just curious to see how someone in their body of work approached a specific subject and dedicated to that subject. So very cool book on that front. Again, another way I've talked about the mountains, if you're into the grand landscapes, a book dedicated towards grand landscapes from one of your favorite photographers is a great way to go. If you're trying to learn small scenes, another way to go. Maybe it's more specific. Maybe it's small scenes in Death Valley. So there's photographers out there you can seek out those books. But it's a way to help me bridge that gap from where I'm at with my small scenes photography to how someone else is doing it. And here I am with a curated look at how to approach that. Okay, so for my second tip, I'm going to recommend books that are curated collections of multiple photographers. Now, on this one, whereas with my photographer piece, I'm not necessarily recommending specific photographers because people's tastes vary. You know, I'm super happy with my, my TJ Thorne book over here, Ebb and Flow. Happy with my Eric Bennett book over here. Uh, great books. They work great for me. Great photographers. Worth checking out. But, you know, they may not be your style. But for the next one, collection of images, I'm sort of a little more prescriptive because th these books are released as a result of a contest called the Natural Landscape Photography awards. This is an annual contest that Matt Payne and others, uh, Tim Perkins, I'm leaving out lots of names that help contribute and help get this awards up and running, but they've done three years of these awards and their focus is on landscape photography awards that embrace the natural form of photography. So things like stretching mountains is not good, sky swaps is not allowed, extensive cloning is not allowed, putting things into the scene that weren't there before is not allowed. Lots of little rules around that to sort of keep it pretty much where I think photography should probably be, which is sort of towards the natural side, but still room to to enhance the light here and, and work with the contrast and create some pleasing images. So with that said, great contest. It's been in existence for three years. Two books are already released and one more is coming. Volume three is already up for pre-sale or available for sale. So I, I encourage that. But let's, let's take a look here real quick. What we've got here is I've got the first two volumes of volume one from the first year of the contest. And we've got volume two from the second year of the contest. And before I take a quick peek in here and just sort of see what we got, why this way? Well, the images that make it into here are sort of as a result of making it a certain portion through judging. So there's an initial screening and then another set of photos go on to the actual judges. Those judges review those images, give them ratings, and then of course there's normal, as with any contest, winners. Well in these books there's more photographs in here than just the winner, so if you scored high in the contest your image could potentially be selected for inclusion in the book. So what this does is it gives you a whole variety of scenes. So there could be, because the contest is different categories, black and white, grand landscapes, small scenes, all of that is in here. So it's a great way to consume a variety of photography. So if you're just trying to figure things out, where are you going, which direction you're gonna go, this collection of images in here is a great way to see a variety of images. Maybe you've never really thought about small scenes or you're like, well, yeah, small scenes, whatever. But then you look in here and you might say, wow, you really can do some interesting stuff with that. Maybe you love your grand landscapes. You know, there's grand landscape images in here. You can see how other people are doing it. How are they approaching it? And then again, the other component is there's multiple photographers in here. So it's a curated collection of multiple photographers work. So maybe you'll learn, discover a new photographer, maybe an up and coming photographer, someone's been around for a while, but just hasn't crossed your social media feed 
speed because of the algorithm. So a really wonderful way to consume a variety of photography from a variety of photographers that has, I would wager, had a pretty high bar to the level of curation. Meaning again, you're sort of seeing the best of the best. So if you're gonna invest in a photography book, this is a great way to go. Like, so let's just pop open book one here. Here, we'll go with this. First page, right where I opened up. We got a photo here from Nigel Hallowell, and this is an ice, a small scene of an ice, ice picture with the cracks in the ice and, and everything like that. So, you know, I've photographed ice before and I've been okay with it. I've been happy with them. But here's an opportunity to sit down and look and see a book that through a panel of judges, people thought this was interesting and warranted a spot in the book. So I can look at this and try to identify what's different between some of my ice images and this particular ice image. And and think about it. And again, that's where the being deliberate pays off. You got, if I just was flipping through the book, oh, pretty ice picture and flip the page, I'm probably not gonna get a lot out of this exercise. But if I pause, look at this image, study the image, I can sort of think, what, what are the differences? What is good? And identify what I need to work on. So again, it's just a small scene example from, uh, this is volume one. Again, highly recommended for that. And let's get volume two, we'll do something similar. We'll open up to a page, pop in there. Um, here we go. So here we are with a couple desert images in here. Uh, I'm guessing that's probably Death Valley. It could see sort of a Badlands image or something like that. But again, an area that I've gone to, area I've photographed, and I can sort of look and see how he approached the scene. What made it better than the images I have? And how, what can I do to improve my images? Somewhere on this, sand dunes. I've photographed sand dunes before as well, of course. And just sort of seeing how they approach it. Again, same can be applied to the grand landscapes in here, the small scenes, but it all offers an opportunity for you to see what made the cut, think about what made those images special, made them different, compare them to yours, and you can sort of walk out of this after consuming these types of books with goals for your photography and how to close those gaps so your landscape photography becomes more consistent and tells better stories. Okay, so I probably went on on that a little bit longer than I thought. I thought this was probably actually gonna be somewhat of a short video just sort of covering the topic of books, but I think I might've gotten a little carried away. We'll see what the runtime ends up on this video at the end. But uh, let's close this thing out. Again, don't get me wrong, learning how your camera works as a tool is important. Learning the guidelines for good composition is important. Practicing and putting those two together out in the field, locally and traveling is important. I'm not saying any of that isn't important. I'm saying when you're at home between downtimes, between trips, another element that can really help improve your landscape photography is consuming other people's photographs. As long as you do it deliberately and think about what made their photos good and consistent. What's the recurring theme? What's the recurring theme across books? I'm going to bet if you look at these two books, different photographers, there's going to be some common elements that helps make compositions and fo photos strong. Could be the composition, could be the editing, but the lighting is, a, you know, is a flat lighting, contrast lighting, a mix of both. All of those things go together. So I'm just saying these photography books is a way for you to improve your landscape photography, consume other photographers' content, consume the best of their best, consume those curated images, and think about it create that list of what's making these photos strong, and then look to identify the gaps from your photography to that. And now you can start setting some goals for when you're out there practicing those camera settings, compositions, to continue to improve. You'll be practicing the right things. So I hope you found today's video helpful. If you did, be sure to hit that like button. And if you wanna see future landscape photography content from me, including tips, tricks, behind the scenes, mini gear reviews, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And thank you for watching.